morning, everybody. My name is Connor Flanagan. I'm the assistant director here at the Southampton History Museum. Uh, this morning, we are joined by uh, Steve Gould, who you might recognize from some of our past programming. He is the research associate here at the museum. And we are also joined by author, uh, professor at the State University of Old Westbury, and a journalist for many years at a lot of different local uh, news publications that many of you have probably read his columns in the past, Carl Grossman. Uh, today we'll be talking about one of Carl's uh, books, The Cold War, um, Cold War on Long Island, sorry. Um, and uh, without any further ado, we're going to pass things over to Carl. If anybody has any questions, please feel free to submit them in the Q&A or the chat below. And we'll make sure to get to those at the end of today's talk. Thanks. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, glad that you're here. Uh, let me start off with uh, some of the uh, oh, activities uh, on Long Island during the Cold War period. And some of them are kind of surprising. Uh, for example, uh, Long Island was studded with uh, uh, nuclear-tipped missile bases. And their mission was to uh, send up uh, nuclear, seriously uh, powerful nuclear-tipped missiles into formations of feared Soviet bombers, uh, particularly Soviet bombers heading to, to bomb New York City. And oh, 10 years ago, I did a television program uh, for WVVH-TV here on, here on Long Island on, uh, well, on these, uh, on these missile bases, particularly one in Rocky Point, and the remnants are still there, and one, would you believe, uh, just off Old Country Road in West Hampton. So if we can, uh, just to set the stage for the Cold War on Long Island, let's, uh, if we could kind of run uh, two clips from uh, uh, this little documentary, uh, which was titled, Avoiding Nuclear Destruction by the Skin of Our Teeth. It's a case of humanity getting by through the skin of its teeth. We're at a former Nike base in Rocky Point, Long Island. It and many Nike and Beaumark bases was set up in the New York metropolitan area in the 1950s to blast Soviet bombers out of the sky with nuclear-tipped Nike and Beaumark missiles. These were the first generation of anti-aircraft missiles, so they weren't seen as being able to score direct hits. So instead, the scheme was to have the nuclear warheads on the Nike and Beaumark missiles detonate when they reached a formation of Soviet bombers blowing the formation apart, but also raining radioactivity down below. This facility in Rocky Point and the Others were closed as the Soviets switched from bombers to intercontinental ballistic missiles. The nuclear tips had enormous power for the Beaumarks, the equivalent of 10 kilotons. The atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Japan had the TNT equivalent of 13 kilotons. The Nike missiles had the power of up to 20 and 30 kilotons. The Beaumarks had a 250 mile range, the Nikes a 100 mile range. It would have been some radioactive rain if they were ever put into use. Here's the guts of the former Nike base in Rocky Point. This is an access hatch which permits soldiers to go down below into a cavernous area where the missiles were stored, the nuclear-tipped Hercules Nike missiles. And if we walk here through all this grass, all quite overgrown, here's the launch site itself. Huge doors, I'd say 40, 50 feet long, welded shut now. They would open, the missile would rise to be fired at those feared Soviet bombers heading to, uh, to New York City.
We're at the former Beaumark base in West Hampton. Here, 56 nuclear-tipped missiles were poised and ready to go. Each of these buildings, look at all these buildings here, had a, had a missile in it. Indeed, the, the roofs of the buildings would open up. We'll see that in a few minutes. The missile would rise, get, be ready to be fired. Gil Anderson, you're the commissioner of the Suffolk Department of Public Works. Yes, sir. And now you're uh, you're the owner of this place. Yes, we're, in, we're in charge of the facility now. The facility was turned over to the county uh, in 72 when it was after it was decommissioned um, in 69 by the federal government. They took the missiles away. Yes, they did, but they left us everything else. And we use this now as a storage facility primarily. We store records in one of the buildings. Each of these silos has uh, the potential to store you know, whatever's needed for various divisions of the county, and we take advantage of it. And then there's also the impound yard. Um, there's a, um, a, a, a shooting range right over to the north of us, and uh, we, we make good use of the site. Now, back in the, in the 50s, early 60s, the concern was Soviet bombers heading to, probably heading to New York City. Correct. That was the concern. And this facility, along with the various Nike bases in the New York metropolitan area, mm -hmm. would fire off these nuclear-tipped missiles, but they didn't have the, uh, the technology then to score direct hits. Correct. So the, the deal was you get that missile right in the middle of a formation of Soviet bombers, mm -hmm. have it detonate. Right and the bombers would seemingly uh, fall to earth but right. with these the are, with the radiation though correct these were these were radar controlled so they would with radar control the direction of the of the missile until it got into the group of you know uh, bombers and would explode and yes and unfortunately there would be um, you know there would be the radiation that would fall out you're a child of the I, yes, I, uh, of the 50s, 60s, too. Right? Correct. Yes, I remember very well the old uh, duck and cover exercises that we had to do as kids. As now the the proprietor of this place, having been from a, a duck and cover generation I mean, in public school, I too were tra was trained to you, you went under the desk right. and uh, you were put you had dog tags too in those days. Yep. How, how do you kind of feel, sort of eerie, sort of on the beachish? at this former Beaumark base being here, considering your background? It is eerie, the quiet, uh, still seeing the structures, you know, in place. I mean, they were built solid. Uh, you look at the concrete, you know, the, the steel's rusty, but it's still there. It, it brings back the memory of those times. Although, uh, to be honest with you, I'm, I'm, I'm glad and I hope we are past those times. You'd hope. Yeah. Uh, let's take a walk, sure. look, look, look at one of these buildings. They're all the same with 56 of these. Uh, Correct. 56 of the structures here here's Four rows um, there was this was where they would roll them in these doors would open up and essentially the missile would be on a cradle that would roll in here if they and thankfully they never had to if they did have to be launched the roof would essentially roll off in either direction split down the middle and then as you said the missile would rise and then would be launched uh, lo looking here as in terms of what's left this is an empty an empty, uh, what would you call this thing? It's basically just an empty silo. That's really what it is. Uh, you know, it's, it's like a garage. It's just a, um, it's a concrete structure, uh, three wall, two walls of concrete, solid concrete floor, and then um, steel doors on either side with the roof that rolled back, steel roof. When the roof comes together, and, and thank heavens it's together today, uh, is it a good seal? Yes, it is. It's still to this day watertight, as you can see. You know, a little water gets in here and there, but considering these are over 50 years old, it's it's, you know, and it, it's amazing how how well these are these are upheld. And and I, I, there's lights of some sort that. Yeah. What, what are those about? Those were those were part of the facility. They were you know if you had to do any work at night or or get in here at night, you wanted to be able to see where you were going. So these basically lit up the. Um, the you know the missiles so if they had to do any work on it they do any maintenance on a building they could see where they were going and and that what is that a heater that thing there i bel i to be honest with you i don't know let's, let's, take, take, a a let's take a look looks like it's an old vent as i believe it's just an old vent these were these were these would open up similar to venetian blinds and, and allow air and if you needed there doesn't seem to be any other equipment to, for air conditioning or anything like that and it wouldn't have been needed you, you, you look at the real what's it's it's quite a quite a proposition there i mean you're, you're 
You're an engineer. Yeah, no, there's a lot of work and a lot of detail and a lot of effort went into these facilities. Um, you know, this was a sign of the time. Sign of the times, uh, indeed. Uh, and Gil Anderson uh, comments uh, about hoping those days are over. And when I was writing this book with uh, Dr. Christopher Verga, who's a historian, uh, teaches Long Island history at Suffolk County Community College. And he asked me to co-author the book with him because as a journalist, I uh, here I did some television. I did a lot of writing through the years on some of these uh, these Cold War uh, happenings, uh, I didn't, you know, I, I thought I was writing a book involving history. And here we seem to be entering a, uh, a we certainly are seemingly entering a new Cold War. Indeed, just yesterday, uh, here I'm looking at, a, at an article, uh, Russia tests nuclear capable missile that Putin calls world be world's best. This is, this is just uh, just yesterday, uh, and uh, Putin declared uh, it is capable of overcoming all modern means of anti-missile defense. Uh, it has no analogous uh, weaponry in the world and won't have for a long time to come. Uh, and it's not just ICBMs. Uh, here, here's a piece uh, about a month ago. Uh, Russia says it may be forced to deploy mid-range nuclear missiles in Europe. Uh, this comes uh, weeks after the invasion of, uh, of Ukraine by Russia. So uh, this stuff isn't all history. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that seemingly having a, a very scariest, uh, scariest encore. And I think it's important to review the kind of... Uh, the kind of things that happened, a lot of them happening on Long Island in regard to uh, to the Cold War and uh, which we write about in Cold War Long Island. Uh, another uh, installation on Long Island, uh, very Cold War focused, was the, uh, the Plum Island Animal Disease Center. And folks generally don't know the original mission of the, uh, the Plum Island uh, Laboratory. It was set up by the Army in 1953. The, its godfather, so to speak, was a, a former uh, Nazi scientist, Dr. Eric Traub. And he, um, uh, he was in charge of an island during World War II, uh, Reims in the Baltic. And uh, what they uh, worked on, on this island uh, at its laboratory was a biological warfare to be used uh, uh, during, uh, during World War II. Uh, he had a connection to Long Island. In fact, uh, in the 1930s, he was here on Long Island uh, going to graduate school in, uh, in New York and uh, came out to Long Island regularly because uh, uh, he went to Camp Siegfried, that, that, that's in Nassau, in, in Yapank, in the middle of Suffolk County, uh, a Nazi parade grounds. And uh, so he was familiar with uh, Long Island and also uh, scientists here in the United States. And he came back to what was called Operation Paperclip, which the U.S. Uh, conducted. Uh, this is after World War II, bringing uh, 1,600 Nazi former Nazi scientists and engineers to the United States. Well, Werner von Braun is a, a prime example, uh, very much involved uh, in the V1 and V2 Nazi rocket program. Uh, he was a, an officer in the SS. Uh, here in this country, he becomes pivotal in terms of US uh, space warfare strategy, ultimately becomes associate director of Nasser. In any case, Eric Traub uh, was able to interest people he knew uh, here in, in, in the United States, particularly at Fort Detrick, which was the biological and chemical warfare center uh, for the US military uh, in uh, doing something like his island of Reims in the Baltic. And that became the Plum Island Animal Disease Center. Uh, indeed, here's a, here's a 1983, 
piece, a major expose by um, John McDonald, an investigative reporter uh, at Newsday. Here's the lead of the story, the beginning of the story. A 1950s military plan to cripple the Soviet economy by killing horses, cattle, and swine. Again, th th this was exactly the same mission that the Islander Reams had uh, under uh, Dr. Trow. Call for making biological warfare weapons out of exotic animal diseases at a Plum Island laboratory, now declassified army records reveal. And then in fact, when John wrote this story in Newsday, uh, the, the cover of Newsday was a, uh, a facsimile of one of the uh, documents that he uncovered. Plum Island will permit the chemical core to execute require uh, projects in connection with imported agents and others that might become a BW biological warfare significance. Uh, ultimately, uh, after about two years, the army, and this is from a, uh, an, another excellent uh, piece of, of journalism done by Mike Carroll. It's a book, Lab 257. And it's a book about, um, about the Plum Island Animal Disease Center and this original mission. Uh, in um, Lab 257, Michael is an attorney, uh, very careful attorney. Uh, and uh, he writes how the Joint Chiefs, the Joint Chiefs of Staff found that a war with the USSR would best be fought with conventional and nuclear means and biological warfare uh, against uh, humans or food animals uh, was uh, then uh, eliminated. Uh, destroying the food supply meant having to feed millions of starving Russians after winning a war. So the, the, the idea, with some idea was, well, just gonna nuke them instead of uh, starving them to death. As to whether at Plum Island, biological warfare activities ended. Uh, I, I really don't know. Newsday did another story. <coughs> this was an earlier piece actually by Drew Featherson and John Cummings, also investigative reporters about a um, breakout of African swine fever in Cuba occurring in 1971. And uh, the story actually connects some very important dots about a container was bought by boat by Cuba, delivered to anti-Castro operatives. Uh, the only place where the virus was known, this is the Newsday piece, to have been kept in the US was at the uh, Plum Island Animal Disease Center. Uh, here's Tom Downey, who's formerly a congressman from Long Island, saying at this time, after the, this Newsday piece, it's preposterous that the US government tried to destroy portions of, uh, of a population's food. So that's Plum Island. I, I, I've visited Plum Island now uh, doing articles through the years, uh, three times. And it's, it's, it's a pretty, well, like I, I remember my first visit there when there was a leak. Uh, well, my first visit there, uh, when it was finally open to um, to the press, uh, and a uh, uh, it was actually a visit arranged because Newsday and I were looking into the connection between biological warfare and Plum Island, and uh, they wanted to show us, oh no, no, no biological warfare. In any case, during that visit, we went into one of the laboratories, and a scientist uh, held up a vial of foot and mouth disease virus. And he said, uh, again, this is right from Cold War Long Island. And it's also just from my story that I did the day after uh, about how the scientist said in his white laboratory coat that there was enough virus in this, in this vial to infect 10,000 trillion cattle with foot and mouth disease. And I quickly asked, asked him, I'm like, like, doctor, why do you need so much, uh, so much of that poison? in your vial and, and quickly he answered, uh, oh, to, before he answered, he also went on to say that uh, that, that figure uh, involved all the cattle that lived on earth, indeed, all the cattle that ever lived on earth. 
uh, could be killed with uh, the amount of uh, foot and mouth disease virus in, in, in that vial. And because he jumped in quickly when I asked him, why do you need all that, that virus saying, um, well, we're not using it for biological warfare. I'm kind of like defensively. Uh, he said it a very, uh, well, uh, frankly, a very eerie place. Uh, uh, people should really get a copy of Lab 257, with, uh, which tells the entire story of, uh, of Plum Island. Then in terms of another uh, federal facility uh, on Long Island, um, Brookhaven National Laboratory uh, is quite the place. I mean, that really comes out of the Manhattan Project. At the end of, I've written a couple of books too on nuclear power. And as readers of my column know, I cover the plan by the Long Island Lighting Company rather intensely to build seven to 11 nuclear power plants on Long Island, which was very tied into Brookhaven National Laboratory. Uh, oh, Phyllis Vineyard, for example, the wife of the director of Brookhaven Lab was on the board of the Long Island Lighting Company pushing nuclear power here. At the end of Lilco's existence for several decades, the chief executive officer, the head of, of Lilco was uh, William Catacasinos, who formerly was associate director at Brookhaven National Laboratory. In any case, to go back to the history of Brookhaven Lab, which is related in um, uh, uh, Cold War Long Island, uh, during the, after, at the wake, at the end of the Manhattan Project, um, they look for some way to uh, well, perpetuate nuclear technology to keep the, the contracts going, GE and Westinghouse, big contractors during the Manhattan Project to keep jobs for the, uh, the hundreds of thousands of people employed in the Manhattan Project. And, uh, but they figured, well, we can't sell nuclear weapons to even an ally, even to the Brits or the French, what else could we do with nuclear technology to uh, really to perpetuate this uh, this vested interest? And uh, one of the a big part of the plan was to set up a a national laboratory. It finally was decided to do it on Long Island at an old army base, Camp Upton, which would uh, do research into atomic physics, but also develop civilian uses of nuclear technology. And that, that's why Brookhaven lab scientists were very close with the LOCO lawyers, with LOCO itself and pushing nuclear power on Long Island. But the other assignment that, uh, or among the other assignments that uh, Brookhaven lab had was, and this is very Cold War, was to send its, its personnel, send its doctors and others to the Marshall Islands, because off the Marshall Islands, the U.S. Uh, was doing testing of uh, atomic bombs and hydrogen bombs. And the impact on the Marshall Islands was, uh, the people of Marshall Islands was, was very intense. And these Brookhaven lab scientists were set over to, uh, to monitor the situation uh, with the people. Uh, it's not a nice story. In fact, ultimately there was a $1 billion settlement uh, by the Marshall Islands Nuclear Claims Tribunal for the people of the Marshall Islands who were, uh, who were affected. Uh, well, here in one of the, um, uh, the affidavits that were filed, context of that, uh, uh, that issue uh, is one resident of the Marshall saying, I believe the BNL doctors came to study us, not to help us. A lot of the information in Cold War Long Island about the activities of uh, these Brookhaven lab folks on the Marshall Islands came from Dr. Glenn Alcolay, who's now uh, back here in, uh, well, he's an anthropology professor here uh, in the New York area. And he was a Peace Corps volunteer in the Marshall Islands. Uh, and he, he talks about, I'm just uh, reading here from the book uh, about, what he saw, how these Brookhaven lab uh, doctors and other personnel uh, were involved with something involving severe shortcomings, including a nearly total lack of sensitivity for the, the Marshallese people. Uh, and he, he, he cites uh, 
this is Glenn Alkaly and some of his uh, his work on what happened to the Marshall Islands uh, during these tests uh, of nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, here are Brookhaven Lab scientists. This is a meeting in 1956 in New York uh, saying that uh, while it is true that these people do not live the way Westerners do, civilized people, it is not nonetheless also true that they are more like us than mice. Uh, well, here's another affidavit where Marshallese says they come to study us like animals in an experiment. Not a very um, glowing uh, uh, passage in the history of Long Island. And finally, uh, let me also speak briefly about um, uh, my journalism through the years, uh, this goes way back, uh, involving the arrest of Robert Glenn Thompson. Uh, he, uh, he was a spy for the Soviet Union. Was a, he ran a fuel oil business in Bayshore. And I remember when, uh, when I, I covered his, uh, his ar arrest and then I interviewed neighbors, what do you know about Robert Glenn Thompson? And the next day, uh, he held a, uh, Sidney Sybin, some of you might know Sidney Sybin, a pretty colorful, now late Long Island lawyer, arranged for a press conference with uh, Robert Glenn Thompson. And uh, Thompson, he, 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 but he, he was um, in Air Force intelligence uh, in the early years of the Cold War and in Berlin. And uh, what he said was that uh, uh, his arrest now as a spy was a result of the the U.S. wanting him to go back into Air Force intelligence with his, his knowledge and so forth. In fact, the headline of the Long Island Press, the Daily Long Island Press, where I worked at the time, uh, banner headline is, when the FBI came, I shook. You know, he was talking about when the FBI came into his fuel oil business. And he went on uh, with what he told. Uh, he told me and the others, uh, uh, this is the day after his arrest that they were trying to get him back in, in, into the military. Well, several months later, um, he pled guilty to espionage and uh, in his confession before the court uh, related how uh, he took photographs of strategic uh, tar potential targets in the New York area. He passed the film on to, uh, uh, to, uh, those who ran him, uh, the Soviet uh, agents who ran him, including at the International Bridge up in Niagara Falls. And uh, in other ways, uh, for years, was a year, was a spy. He ultimately was, uh, was sentenced to 30 years in jail. He was traded after, I think it was 14 years for a US uh, uh, spy. But um, the day after he pled guilty, he, he was out on bail and I went over to his house, uh, knocked on the door uh, in Bayshore. And uh, actually I looked through the screen door and there, there was Robert Glenn Thompson with his two sons and a can of beer in his, in his hand uh, watching television. In fact, what he was watching, this is, it's just not in Cold War Long Island, but I just think it's kind of amusing that old TV show, I Spy. Uh, and in any case, I, come in. He was friendly enough. I sat down and, and I said, why did you tell that story? You know, and uh, uh, sorry, you know, and then he went on to uh, articulate uh, on his activities. And that was my next story about Robert Glenn, Glenn Thompson. So uh, to sum up, Long Island had these pretty, uh, oh, well, we were very much involved in the Cold War. And a, a lot of the book, Cold War Long Island, Long Island talks about uh, Long Island being an arsenal for the Cold War. Be, that began during World War II, Grumman and Sperry and, and um, Fairchild, and all, all these, these weapons manufacturers here on Long Island. Furthermore, very importantly, um, the United Nations uh, really begins at Lake Success in an old Sperry's plant uh, in Nassau County uh, before it was able to move to its, its quarters in, in Manhattan. So Long Island in, in many respects was very tied 
into uh, into the Cold War, and also what the UN represents was uh, somehow a way to uh, to deal with war, to end war. I, I was on a, I think I did a column in the Southampton Press, East Hampton Press, just last week. How for twenty years uh, I was a member of a commission at the UN on uh, uh, disarmament, education, conflict resolution, and peace. And as, as you go into the entrance of uh, the UN, uh, I wrote in the column, you see a, uh, uh, it was a statue of a man with a hammer in his hand, beating a sword into uh, a plowshare, as Isaiah uh, says in the Bible. And then right next to it, a, a huge statue of a pistol with its, with, with its uh, just twisted up uh, uh, to uh, preclude any, any weapon from being uh, fired from it, its barrel being twisted into a knot. Uh, so here was the UN, and indeed, at the UN, and um, this goes back to the establishment of the UN, 47, 48, uh, Bernard Baruch uh, attempted to uh, well, put a lid to, to stop, to put an end on the development of nuclear weapons. Uh, and that was uh, resisted, actually, by, uh, by, by the Soviet Union. Uh, they felt they couldn't trust this U.S. plan, which was too bad because, uh, well, uh, we can talk about this later too. At, at the end of World War I, the world understood that chemical weapons were just a, just a terrific, a horrific, uh, they shouldn't be used. I mean, they had been used, mustard gas and other chemical weapons widely in, in, in World War I and, and high levels of casualties. So after World War I, the world came together and said, uh, we have to ban the use of nuclear weapons. And in a, a number of treaties did. Uh, I mean, it's not been perfect. Uh, they've been used uh, uh, a number of times, uh, uh, nuclear weapons, but uh, chemical weapons. But that genie was largely put back in the bottle. And it was, it's sad that the uh, that nuclear genie wasn't wasn't put back in the bottle uh, uh, when the UN started here on Long Island, but it's still an open question. I mean, Hiroshima, Nagasaki occurred, uh, but before uh, Putin might use his new ICBM, before we use, and I showed in that video uh, those silos on Long Island. But today, there are silos, uh, particularly in the upper Midwest with soldiers uh, sitting uh, panels with buttons ready to push a push the button on the order of the president of the united States and states and send a, a a nuclear missile towards uh towards russia or to china uh we have submarines uh, many of them made right across from long island uh, up the thames river if you go up take the ferry from orient point you go up past that uh, electric boat facility where they make these uh, these uh, nuclear powered submarines ready to to launch uh, nuclear missiles uh, and then you have uh, the traditional way for a uh, a bomb to be dropped from a from a bomber b1s and b2 bombers is so called so called nuclear triad which is alive and well and there there's a whole parallel nuclear war system uh, in, in, in Russia today, and just let me end by saying, and I think this is just terrible, both we and Russia are both deeply involved in, a, um, in programs to modernize our nuclear weapons program instead of, uh, instead of eliminating, abolishing nuclear weapons uh, so we could, uh, well, so we don't return to uh, well, just one little addition. When I went to PS 136 in St. Albans growing up, we were given dog tags to wear uh, if there would be a nuclear apocalypse. Uh, we did duck and cover exercises regularly, ducking up under the desk uh, in fear of uh, the Soviets bombing us. And I, I, I have done presentations in, in Russia and people in Russia talk about the same scary world that they lived in uh, in this period. 
This is a world we should not have to return to. Cold War Long Island should be history. Uh, it shouldn't be a new Cold War involving us and our children uh, here on Long Island. So let me that. <laughs> Thanks, Carl. That's wonderful. And just for folks, this is Carl's book, Cold War, Long Island. Um, highly recommended. Interesting book. Again, talks in more detail about some of the stuff that Carl just talked about. Um, and as uh, just as a reminder to folks looking in, uh, we will take some questions uh, at your convenience. So please uh, uh, send in your questions to Carl if you have any. Um, I got a couple of questions quickly. I, I, the discussion about uh, the United Nations in Lake Success is fascinating and something I've never realized before until I read your book. Um, the whole story about how that came to Long Island is intriguing. intriguing. I'm kind of curious about you know, why Lake Success became the, uh, the headquarters for the United Nations. I think there, there was a building available uh, and they, the plan was to go to New York ultimately. And here, uh, here they it was in commuting range from Manhattan, and uh, it was a spare old Sperry's facility, uh, and it was available and it was used. Interesting that it was used as a military purpose before the war, so or during the World War II, which is sort of fascinating. A couple of really important things happened at the United Nations there. As I recall, the uh, is Israel was recognized as a state during the sessions there, and I think uh, the military action or the police action in Korea also was uh, something that occurred there at, uh, at the United Nations. So um, really important Cold War era events that occurred right in Lake Success. Yeah, and, and I teach at uh, SUNY College at Old Westbury where a lot of the kids, students are from Nassau County. And uh, they, most of them, are, almost all of them are not aware of this interesting Long Island history regarding the United Nations and uh, international diplomacy. Yeah, it's fascinating that that was right here. Um, no, yeah, we talked a bit about this before is our, our children don't realize some of the things that occurred in the past, uh, the United Nations in particular. Um, the thing that I've been uh, telling my daughter about is the Berlin Wall and that was built in the early 1960s and the Berlin Airlift uh, just after the war um, so this Cold War thing has lasted for a bit of a while since basically the end of the Second World War um, and doesn't seem like it's ending, uh, especially with the stuff that's happening in the Ukraine. Yeah, it's, it's uh, well, the Ukraine, a major focus of the commission I was on at the UN was on conflict resolution. Hmm. And uh, we studied uh, as a commission and uh, how war can be avoided uh, uh, we develop a peace studies program for colleges and universities around the world. In fact, I was involved in the unveiling of that program in, um, in Japan. Uh, I gave presentations on behalf of the commission. My hope was, after 20 years on this commission, is that maybe humanity has, uh, oh, has gone into a new chapter. Uh, maybe uh, we could, uh, war might be, you know, maybe something in talking about war, Cold War, war in general, something in history, but this invasion of you and, and, and what's being done, the, the savagery, the brutality, uh, the, the innocent civilians uh, being murdered. And it's, it's, I mean, war is really a, a, another name for, uh, for mass murder. And you would hope that humankind, uh, you know, figure out other ways to uh, to manage uh, its relations with other countries. And and just let me note, though, it isn't just uh, well one group of people who before well when I was writing the book, I didn't think we'd have a a, a core of the Cold War. But I should have kind of picked up that this is in, in 2020, this is just a couple of years ago, the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists. And, and these are folks who are, who are nuclear scientists, some from our, our national weapons laboratories and so forth originally. 
Uh, they uh, set up in 1947 a doomsday clock, a doomsday clock, which they define as signifying nuclear annihilation. That's the word annihilation. And in 2020, uh, they set the doomsday clock closer to midnight, which is, you know, the point of nuclear annihilation, closer to midnight than uh, any time ever in its history since, uh, since 1947. Uh, the same year, um, uh, the following year to 2021, kept it at 100 seconds to, uh, to midnight. And this year, now this is before the invasion of Ukraine, kept it 100 seconds uh, to midnight. I think if it would have been the resetting of the clock after the in February 24th invasion of Ukraine, it would have come closer to midnight. Indeed, um, uh, this is Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, uh, talking about uh, this is humanity being on the the brink. This is Guterres, who's uh, he's from Portugal, on the brink of of, of uh, a possible uh, nuclear war. And the kind of nuclear war that can occur now, I mean, speaking of the Thames River over in Connecticut and those nuclear submarines, uh, one of the kinds of submarines that was produced there is the Ohio class submarine. And here, let me just read from, this is from the National Interest, which is a very middle of the road, it's online uh, publication speaks about the Ohio class submarines, maybe the most destructive West weapon system created by humankind. Each of the vessels can carry 24 Trident II submarine launched ballistic missiles. Uh, as a Trident II re-enters the atmosphere at speeds up to Mach 24, it splits into up to eight independent re-entry vehicles. And the, the atomic weapons cap, they have multiple warheads, in short, a full salvo from an Ohio class submarine, which can be launched in less than one minute, but unleashed up to 192 nuclear warheads. This is a nightmarish weapon of the apocalypse. I mean, I don't think we should wait for this. I mean, often in human history, we wait for the disaster to happen to kind of change our ways. Are, are we gonna wait? you know, for, for this kind of thing to happen. Something that would actually, uh, hate to say dwarf Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but it's it, it, much more catastrophic, uh, much more. I mean, that was one of the things that Biden had to say, Biden had to say, sorry, Putin had to say in announcing uh, this, uh, uh, this launch uh, of a, a new and yet more powerful ICBM uh, yesterday. Uh, let me get the quote, if I can, quick from uh, from what he said, if I can, quickly. He talks about, uh, here we go, Russia tests nuclear capabilities. He talks about uh, consequences that you have never encountered in your history, he warns the West. Uh, th this is not something, and, and it isn't something... When, you, when you're talking about, uh, well, nuclear annihilation, you're talking about annihilation, you're talking about uh, nuclear winters and uh, radioactivity that'll, you know, uh, on this scale, that's gonna be around for all but forever. I mean, let, also very important, if I could, talking about this, is that the, the there was a, a very important vote. Uh, let's get it right here. This is at the UN. Uh, this is the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the Nuclear Weapons Ban Treaty. It was adopted in 2017, opened up for signature September 2017, uh, entered into force, uh, this is last year, January 20. 21. And uh, I mean, 
it's not international law now, really, because other nations have to uh, sign on. Uh, but uh, this is something that I think we all must work for, the, uh, the full enactment of the prohibition of nuclear weapons, to put that genie back in the bottle and uh, deal with it the way our forebearers dealt with chemical weapons after World War I. Yeah, let's hope that that somehow works its way through. Uh, as you mentioned, it's trying to put the genie back in the bottle. And uh, sadly, we're seeing that uh, it, that's harder to do than a lot of people thought it was going to be. Absolutely. It's, it's uh, you know, it's there's a lot of vested interest. I spoke about vested interest before. Uh, those involved in the, the building of nuclear weaponry, those who profit from war, and those who are just blind to the consequences of um, of nuclear war. Uh, you know, I mean, like we started uh, our program today with uh, those Beaumark and Nike Bissell's bases on Long Island. And it wasn't just Long Island. I mean, we focus on Long Island. But, you know, I, I focus on some, I did it for a Long Island uh, TV station, but there was 145 Nike Hercules bases and also, if, if, when people say Nike missiles, the earlier generation were Nike Ajax missiles. Those were not nuclear tipped. And then the, uh, the additional generation, the newer generation with these Nike Hercules. The nuclear. technological enhancement was the nuclear tipped. Oh, yeah. And, and, and 29 Bomark, and Bomark, if anybody is curious, stands for Boeing. Michigan Aeronautical Research Center. Uh, you have, you have a, a, a lot of, well, a lot of forces behind, uh, I mean, nuclear war is not winnable. It's no. suicidable. Uh, it, 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 it's, it's mere suicide. It's just so, but again, Human beings seem to wait for the disaster to strike to uh, to figure out uh, how best to uh, to change their ways, and this isn't something that you can wait for. No, um, I don't know if we have any questions, uh, Connor, but um, I'll see if there are any questions from from the audience. Um, yeah, so uh, we have uh, two two uh, things here. One is uh, saying. Uh, Many thanks for the shocking presentation today and great work, Carl. Um, and the, the other message says, uh, hello, Carl, Tom Edmonds here. He's the executive director here at South <laughs> History Museum. Uh, did you know Penny Wright and I were planning a surprise 50th anniversary in journalism party for you? Uh, the original plan was for May of 2020. Uh, COVID kind of interrupted our plans of that. But uh, are you ready for a uh, 52nd anniversary party? Absolutely. You know, I, I was looking for Penny had arranged uh, a presentation and all. Uh, and I was really looking forward to, to uh, I mean, this is an area I've covered. I've covered other, other issues on Long Island. And, uh, and I, I, I go, as a journalist, I function uh, uh, well, I write for national outlets. And uh, I have a, actually, I have a... a a blog on the Times of Israel, even. Uh, so it would be fun to tell the stories of, uh, of what I've covered, but COVID kind of uh, stopped that from happening. And I, I, I was really, uh, I was really disappointed and I'd love to, uh, uh, to revive, uh, you know, that possibility. It would be, uh, it would be very nice. Well, yeah, I think I can speak for the museum here saying, I think we'd be happy to have you back to do any kind of future programming. Um, I think the tentative idea, I think, was at that lecture that got canceled was at the end for us to walk in with a cake or something for you. Uh, <laughs> so maybe, maybe we'll be able to do that again here in the future. Um, but uh, I want to thank you, Carl, for today's talk and Steve for, for helping out. And um, I want to encourage everybody to, again, uh, search Carl's book. Uh, Carl, where's the best place for anybody to buy it? Well, I, I, Amazon, I, bookstores. Yeah, well, lo local bookstores, I would always, you always know. Recommend. Uh, you know, uh, uh, and of course, I would push Canio's, my local bookstore here in Sag Harbor, a wonderful uh, 
community asset. Uh, and that sounds like the best place for people to go pick it up. Yeah, I mean, you can get it from Amazon, that's for sure. Uh, but uh, uh, always nice to support local businesses. Very true. Well, thank you again for joining us for today's talk. And thank you, everybody, for watching and enjoying. And hopefully, we will see you all next time. Have a good day, everybody.